semifinal presented by AT&T. The granddaddy of them all. We call it the Rose Bowl. With some thorns though this year, Alabama got the call instead of an unbeaten Florida State team. With this Michigan's head coach, Jim Harbaugh, he's been swimming in some hot water for much of this season. Now his number one Wolverines take the field in hopes of winning a national title for the first time since 1997. They will have to go through a perennial powerhouse Alabama Crimson Tide, though, as we welcome you on the field alongside former NFL QB Matt Sims. Scooby McGuess is ready. He's got the rose in the mouth. You I'm Sam it. Ravage. <laughs> so great to have you along with us. We got an hour-long show leading you up to both semifinal games. We'll head over to New Orleans in just a bit, guys. But, I mean, this is amazing. The pageantry yeah. leading up to the main event of Michigan-Alabama. Give me one or two questions that you have for both teams leading into this one. I mean, the first one, we got to start with just the head coaches. Saban, Harbaugh, I mean, this is the granddaddy of them all. Yeah. These are two of the best coaches in all of college football. And who wins that chess match? That's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Who makes that in-game adjustment to get their team the victory today? And it's not just in-game. It's about the prep leading up to the game. Yeah, One right. thing that Michigan did differently, which J.J. McCarthy spoke on, is their preparation has changed. Less padded practices. It's a lot less overthinking because over the past two seasons, he said it was paralysis from over analysis. Mm. So the prep coming into this game has been different for the Michigan team, and they feel like they're healthier, they're less banged up, and Matt, with a coach who's done it already and another coach who might have one foot out the dough, I can't <laughs> wait to see the result. Uh, look, these are two of the winningest programs in the entire sport. We see a lot of blue here today. I don't know if we're going to see as much red as we do blue, but I mean, this is pretty hey, special. This is a Michigan home game right now. We saw it too Facts. in our hotel, yeah. the lobby, all that. It's Michigan all day. I feel like it just means more right now to the maize and blue here. So looking forward to see how that atmosphere plays into how Alabama manages the game as well. Yeah, we just we just heard the roar. A lot That's of the Michigan fans right there. They came in deep, <laughs> and I love that you made that point because we've just been looking around trying to get a feel of like yeah. what it's like. A lot more Michigan fans. A lot of maize and blue here today. We heard uh, them booing Alabama when they just came out on the field. <laughs> I'm sure we will hear a lot more uh, from the maize and blue in a little while. We've got a lot more coming up from the Rose Bowl as well. But, guys, this is not the only semifinal going on today. We yes, do sir. have another one in New Orleans now with the Sugar Bowl. Totally, totally forgot about that the Sugar Bowl. the Sugar Bowl. Washington and Texas in the Sugar Bowl. So let's go from one L.A. to another L.A. and say hi to our friends Christine, Harry, and Harry. Guys, how are we doing over there? Wow, I like how you did that, Sam. One L.A. to the other L.A. Yes, we are in New Orleans, <laughs> Louisiana here at Caesar Superdome getting ready for the All-State Sugar Bowl. It's going to be a very exciting one, obviously. We got Alabama, or sorry, Texas, taking on Washington. Uh, guys, I mean, we've been doing this all season. Now it's a CFP. How yes. are we feeling as we go into this one? I, I feel pretty good. Um, I think all four teams in the college football playoffs are very deserving uh, to, to, to be in this position in the semifinals. The two teams that we have here. When you look at Washington, mm -hmm. you look at Texas, they've been able to handle their business this season. We have these two high fly-powered offenses. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a lot of points in this matchup tonight. Yeah. 100%. And I mean, just looking and talking about this game, right, the last month, I keep going back and forth, whether it's with this game or the game over in Pasadena. Yeah. Who could win? You, I could convince yep. myself of any team, not just winning today, but also winning in a week. Yeah. So I'm excited to get this thing kicked off. Okay. Also want to shout out the fact that all of us – we're ready for the occasion. We dress really well just for the CFP. I expect us to be even better when we go to Houston, just FYI. <laughs> um, okay, so we like to start every single show that we do with something that we call three big things. This is the things that we're looking forward to today. Yes. What are you looking forward to, Lyles? Oh, uh, I mean, you know, I'm still going to keep mine, but I saw that length shirt that uh, Jalen Milrow had Shout on. And, and I was, was going to switch it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yo, for me, it, it's it's surrounded with the Rose Bowl, but Alabama specifically, because HD, you and I were talking about this yesterday. 
and you thought I was crazy because you couldn't remember the last time Alabama played in a Rose Bowl, it was played at Jerry World, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and the beauty of the Rose Bowl, you know, and Sam sort of laid this out, is it is one of the best tradition, yeah. right? It's, it's where legends are made, all the scenics, everything of it. And Devontae Smith had one of the best Rose Bowl performances we've ever seen in three quarters, 130 yards, three touchdowns, mm -hmm. cemented his status. And he did it to Gerald. I'm honestly just grateful for as many of the weird and awful things that the pandemic did, yeah. including moving That's the right. Rose Bowl right. of all games to another location. Yeah. I'm glad it's back. I've, I'm glad we got two match a matchup between two teams, the most storied in college football. I will never take any of these games ever for granted ever again just because of what we saw in 2020. Yeah, especially when you think about this season, and this is the last season that we're going to see the CFP in this format, so definitely not taking that for granted. HD, what you got? Well, for me, you look at Washington from an offensive standpoint, and you think it's Michael Penix Jr., which it is, and you think it's the wide receiver group, and which it is, but in order for all those things to go right for the Washington Huskies, the engine to everything that makes it work is that offensive line. There's a reason why they're the Joe, uh, Joe Moore Award winners which goes to the best offensive line in the country. Those guys have been stout blocking for Dylan Johnson. Those guys have been stout protecting Michael Penix Jr. He was a Heisman candidate this season as well. Those offensive linemen up front, they play a big part in that. And I'm a big fan of big guys need loving too. If it's not the wide receiver group on the football field, the offensive linemen are my favorite group, and I love giving those guys love because they do a lot of the dirty work. They do a lot of the yep. nasty work that doesn't get, you know, you know, as much light shine on right. as it should. Yeah. So I'm going with that offensive line of Washington and, and how they've been able to perform this season, allowing that offense to be balanced, right? It's not just the pass game, but it's also the run game that make them so good. Big boys need love and two. I like that. Um, okay, for mine, it's very simple, but I don't know if you guys have really thought about this, all right? So when you think about the four teams that are in the semifinals, Washington should be the team that, like, everybody that doesn't want to root for any of the other three teams can root for. Everybody hates Michigan. We know what's happened all throughout the season. We honestly didn't even know if they'd make it this far in the season because of all the things that happened, quote, off the field. Uh, obviously, we know Alabama. People don't like Alabama already. And then they get into the CFP after beating Georgia because, you know, FSU and the mm -hmm. same thing with Texas. So if you're looking for a team to cheer for in the CFP because you absolutely hate the other three, it is this Washington team. So I think it's very interesting because I feel like all of America that's not a fan of Texas, Alabama, or Michigan is rooting for Washington to make it into the CFP. It's a good point, you agree? Yeah, and, my, and Michael point. Penix has one of the great stories in college football. Exactly. Like, I think it's so easy to forget where he came from to where yeah. he is now because he is so great now. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're going to talk about this matchup a little bit more later. But when you think about Michigan, they haven't won since 2016. That, guys, wow. is eight years. I know it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. But Ooh. if they're going to want to win this one, they have to focus on their running game. Take a look at this. Everybody in America knows it. The key to beating Michigan is stopping the run. Hands it to Corum. Bounces outside to the blue. Touchdown, Blake Corum. They got a monster. Bounces off of tackles, breaks arm tackles. Having a dominant run game is just the quarterback's best friend. He's a hard move running downhill, one of the best backs in the country. We're smash mouth. Smash you know, we like to run the ball, and we like to stop the run, so that would be a challenge for us, and we're ready to embrace it. Gets hit, and down he goes! That's Alabama defense right there. Our defense is 11 train killers, ready to flock to the ball and make some plays. We have this little slogan, it's called DOA, dead on the route. I see a team that flies around, a defense that has a motive. We know it's going to be a dog fight, we know it's going to be 60 minutes. And the best game of the century. It's the granddaddy of them all. Here at the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. It is a beautiful day, by the way, here in Pasadena, California. We are just about yes, an sir. hour away from kickoff at the Rose Bowl between Alabama and Michigan. And look who's joining us, Holly Rose, getting ready to, uh, to be on the broadcast today on the Good Michigan stuff. sidelines. And Holly, this Michigan program has kind of been cloaked in controversy this year. At least on the outside, it appears as it it might be a last dance between Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. Have you gotten the vibe that that is the case or not necessarily? From the inside, it doesn't feel that way. From the players' perspective, okay. it doesn't feel that way. You know, we've actually talked to a lot of the coaches about their coaching future, and they say we're focused on this one game. I know what the outside looks like. Jim Harbaugh's hired a very powerful agent. Yeah. The Chargers are looking for a new coach. They practiced out at their stadium this week. I, I, I read the tea leaves a little bit, and we might need to just be honest that maybe the NCAA rules and structure, maybe that's not something Jim Harbaugh enjoys, but I do know this. He enjoys this team, and he enjoys coaching this football team 
team. He's a Michigan guy through and through. He came to his first Rose Bowl when his dad was coaching for Michigan at 11 years old. And now here he is uh, yeah. warming up with the quarterbacks behind <laughs> us. He's got his cleats on, his wide receiver gloves on. Yeah. I know that Jim Harbaugh really loves college football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's literally right behind us. We'll, we'll open up so you guys can get a good look at it. Harbaugh on the field. But, you know, when I think about this semifinal game, Holly, Harbaugh has lost six straight bowl games. Nick Saban is 6-1 uh, in semifinal games. But there's a lot of pressure on both sides. So my question to you is, since this is or isn't the last dance, which coach has the most pressure? I actually think it's Nick Saban. You know, Jim, Jim Harbaugh hasn't won in a college football yeah. playoff setting, so he hasn't been expected to. All Nick Saban done, has done is win in these mm. moments, win national championships. And I personally was getting really irritated the last couple of years with all of the, the dynasties over, Nick Saban's era is over, all this stuff. I, I view him as the greatest coach we've ever had, <laughs> and it ain't over until it's over with Nick Saban. And, you know, I, I think he's got the most pressure because he's been there, he's done that, he's expected to do it in a way that Michigan is yeah. not. Speaking of which uh, Alabama just yeah. came in. That's the roar that you just heard. And I feel the energy rumbling, Matt. Go ahead the, ask the your evil question. empire is in the stadium. <laughs> now, uh, we all know J.J. McCarthy, Blake Corum. They're the heart and soul of this football team. Who else has Nick Saban been impressed with with this Michigan team and what they bring to the table today? Yeah, I actually thought it was really interesting this week. Nick Saban brought up Cortland Loveland. He's the tight end, yeah. number 18, and he is a big kid. J.J. McCarthy said he is a wide receiver in a tight end body. He moves. He can cut. He can his hips, his ankles bend, and then he catches everything. I just watched his entire pregame warm-up. He had a one-handed grab running out of bounds in the end zone like Odell, really. Yeah. And I think that that is the mismatch. Who covers him? You know, he's 6'5", 240. He's a big body, but he moves so well. I think that's probably the matchup of the game right. outside of the line of scrimmage. That's the first of course, always, always line of scrimmage, but that's the next one. Yeah, and, and I love that you brought that up because, you know, in prep, a part of my notes, I was looking at what Alabama uh, struggles with. At the wide receiver position, they're only giving up about four yards uh, per, compl for, per attempt. But then at the tight end position, it's over seven. And then at the running back position, it's seven. Donovan Edwards, how much of a key part is he going to be in this game, especially when it comes to the passing attack? Yeah, I think Donovan Edwards is the kind of the forgotten man on this team. He's yes. got 30 receptions this season. Yeah. He's good at running the ball, but because Blake Corum decided to stay, they've had to find other ways to use him, and he's one of the best athletes on this team. 30 receptions, they trust him out of the Ooh. backfield, and I do think that he's a forgotten man, somebody to keep an eye on as well. We got Holly Rowe joining us pregame again. As you can see, the clock is ticking down. 46 minutes to go until kickoff, Holly. Uh, talk a little bit more about the defensive side for Michigan because they got their work cut out for them going against Jalen Milrow today. What's been the focus for Jesse Minter in this defensive group coming into this one? Yeah, it's really interesting, and you guys as football people will really appreciate this, is the pass rush is usually one way. Guys want to get upfield and get to the quarterback. They've been trained their whole lives, get upfield, get to the quarterback. Yeah. This game, Michigan has said over and over, they have to have what they're calling an unselfish pass rush. That means all they're worried about is the pass, is the lane. They cannot let Jalen Milrow step up into those lanes mm, and they can't get behind yeah. the quarterback and get too deep. So I really love that. An unselfish pass rush. It's a different mindset for guys. You know this. <laughs> yeah. You guys aren't trained that way. But I they know it have too to well, be. unfortunately. The quarterback. Yes, I'm sorry. Absolutely. It's okay. PTSD. You win there. I do my Tennessee games played against Alabama. I, I got hit unnecessarily too many times. I actually but. did that game, and so I'm glad you're still standing there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, and I thank my parents, too, for those good, strong genes that I got that way. But, you know, the other aspect that I look, too, Alabama left tackle a freshman, an 18-year-old young yeah. man here on this stage. Yes. Is that going to be something that Michigan really attacks in this game? I will say this. Texas did in the second game of the year. Right. Texas went after him, and they had great success. I do think Texas's defensive front is bigger, stronger, and better Ooh. than Michigan's. I, I know people are going to hate me for saying that, but I believe it. Yeah. I think that young man has also improved a lot. So think about this. Caden Proctor is 6'7". Mm. Over two, uh, 360 pounds. That's a big boy. Yeah. And his That's a big boy. feet are size 18. <laughs> so when he's doing that back kick and, you know, trying to get out of the way in the yeah. defensive ends, he's a big man. Right. I think he's improved. Maybe could be still an area they attack. We'll have to see. Yeah.
Michigan Wolverine offense looks like they are making their way onto the field. Holly, we'll let you go. We know you got some work to do. Enjoy the game. Thanks for having me, guys. I that like Thank you so Thank much. You Hold on. Before you leave, here's a rose. Oh, oh, that's, oh. Look at this. That's, that's what we do with that. The first bowl. impression at rose. the Rose Bowl. <laughs> we will see Holly in Houston next week. In the meantime, let's get you back to New Orleans with Christine, Harry, and Harry. Guys, the floor is yours. All right, fellas. Now, Christina Harry, I think tonight in this matchup, Texas versus Washington, it's imperative that the defensive line of Texas is dominant like they were versus the Alabama Crimson Tide if they want a trip to Houston, Texas for the national championship. And it all starts with Tavondre Sweat, their defensive tackle. Texas is going to bring pressure off the left side of the formation, creating one-on-ones. If you think you're going to block Sweat one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to be a long day for you. As you see on the screen, dance, big fella dance. I love everything about this. Now, next you're going to see Anthony Hill Jr. He's going to be on the right side of the defensive formation. You're going to see speed, and watch that little dip move at the end that allows him to get past that offensive tackle. And we all know in college football how hard it is to sack Jalen Milrow. And last but not least, you got the strong man. I call him Ethan Burke. You see him in a four-point stance, that means he means business. And you're going to see him do all this right here, sacking the quarterback with leverage and power. It's everything. If the Texas Longhorns are able to do that defensively tonight against Michael Penix Jr., they're going to punch their ticket to the national championship. All right, guys, uh, welcome back. We now welcome in a man who needs no introduction, especially when you think about this matchup today. It is Vince Young, the uh, champion, of course, quarterback of the Longhorns, uh, not too long ago. You know, it hasn't been that long. Welcome. Thank you for yeah, joining I'm us. Old. Yeah. I hear you. I'm old. I'm old. You see the grades. I didn't say it. I didn't say that. That's all you. That's all you. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about the fact that obviously you guys haven't won a championship in a very long time. Um, but I think it was about five years ago, right, when Sam Ellinger said we're back. You guys are in the CFP. It's 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 been a a, a little a long time coming, I'll say. Yes. Um, but now that they're back and they have a chance to win another national championship, what does this mean for this program? Well, it means a lot for us because you know a lot of people don't understand. Like we've been rebuilding. When I mean rebuilding, not only just the football team, we've been rebuilding our stadium. These guys been having meetings and pretty much on the floor in different places. Coaches didn't really have their own uh, meeting room stuff like that. So. Uh, and the chemistry was off. So that's, and you know, everybody know, like, if you don't have the right chemistry, you're not going to win. So I really feel like Coach Stark is doing a really good job with that. The chemistry is back. The guys are hanging out together, doing a lot of things together. And now you see them taking back off. And then he has the players that he wants. So a lot of that stuff was really bad for a couple of years, being alone. <laughs> but I really feel like we right where we need to be at. And you know, obviously you can see it for right now. So I'm very happy for those those young guys. No, 100%. You know, for somebody who – I think you have the legend of all legends. I'll, I'll go – I'll say it, yeah. right? I, I mean, I you have the signature it. moment when people yep. paint a picture of what college football is mm -hmm. and, and the tradition and everything that comes with it. Your Rose Bowl is one of the first things that come to mind. I'm curious from your perspective, what is the advice that you would give to – we have four great quarterbacks playing yeah. today. Yeah, exactly. Just what would your advice be to them? And, and, and you know, you even obviously have a connection with Jalen Milrow, knowing him as a, as a youngster. I'm just curious what your thoughts would be. Well, yeah, just enjoy the moment. You know, it's, it's tough. It's, people think this is easy to be at these type of games. So all the hard work that you put in in the offseason, when you first put that ball in your hand when you was in Little League, all these things is to, came to this point. So the main thing, enjoy the moment and have fun. Don't try to do nothing what you've been doing. You know, the whole world is watching, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's all about your preparation. The same stuff that you did every game to get here, do the same thing here. Let everybody else, let the coaches and everybody take care of the media and all that type of stuff. You just focus on your teammates and working your butt off in preparation to get ready to play the game. I think that's one of the biggest things, Vince, like that, that we know, you know, personally, there's a lot of people may make this game bigger than what it is, exactly. but internally as players, as coaches, if we sense that around one another, then we know some things are off. It's just another game. Now, it might be magnified times three, but exactly. it can't be that in our, in our eyes, exactly. in our opinions on the inside. But me, being a smaller type guy, and I love to eat. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you probably think I'm going to talk to you about football. Not at all. I'm going to talk to you about Vince Young Steakhouse. Hey. Because every time I go to Austin, Texas, Thank you. ask Harry. This, that's where I eat every single <laughs> mm -hmm. day. I get that shrimp gratin. That's how you know I'm not he lying. He's not right. playing about that. The appetizers <laughs> on, on the menu. Exactly. And what was the thought behind that, man? And why was, why was it so pivotal for you to have a steakhouse in Austin, Texas, where you play college football? Well, first of all, thank you for that. <laughs> Vince Young's take out. But, you know, the, you know, the world always tell you you can't. You can't. You can't. But somebody told me I, I couldn't do a restaurant. And when, when somebody told me I can't, when somebody told me I wasn't going to be a successful Black uh, athlete quarterback. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. When people tell me I can't, that motivates me. So I got with my friends, Phil and Laura, and we, they was already going to school. Well, my partner was going to culinary school to, to be a chef, and then my other partner, she was in marketing. And it was great, made it this a great piece. But when somebody tell me you can't, the main thing I tell people, you got to be hands-on. You can't let people do it for you. That's when you lose money. That's mm -hmm. when you make mistakes, which I have been through in my life. Mm -hmm. But with that, I had a really blessed opportunity, and, and we rolled with it, and it's doing really good in Austin. So thank you for shouting that out. So anytime y'all come to Austin, y'all will have orange carpet treatment, <laughs> free steaks on VY. I love that. I love that. Could, you, could you imagine telling this person you can't do know, something right? That's wild. of That's all wild. people? That's wild. That's wild. It's very motivating. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I want to talk about one more thing because I see that all of you guys have on a jacket that says, oh, yeah. unlike regular people, Explain what that means and, and what this it's represents. It's just a feeling. It's a different feeling. You know, again, it's kind of good advice to what I just said. But when people tell you you can't, you know, you, you know, just do the under, uh, unexpected, you know what I mean? So think, you know, you're not regular like everybody else. Do something different. Change the game. You know, I'm the first to graduate in my family. Um, my son is up next. You know, it's a lot of things that's going on in my life. And when people tell me I can't, you know, I think outside the box. We are not like regular people. Think outside the box. Do something different. So that's why we, you see me, my son, and my, my wife over there. We rocking the jacket. So we're going to pass that message today. Happy New Year. And thinks outside the box, unlike regular people. I got to get a prediction from you. I got to <laughs> yeah, get a prediction. Sure. Oh, man. Prediction, score, final score this game. Wait, wait. Let's do the Rose Bowl because we already know he's choosing Texas, right? <laughs> <laughs> he can't choose anybody other than Texas. So let's go to the Rose Bowl. Choose Alabama, Michigan. Who do you got Let in that Let me tell y'all something. Don't nobody want to play Alabama right now. Mm -hmm. They on fire. Mm -hmm. And when we beat uh, Alabama early in the year, when I mean I never seen Coach Saban that pissed off, because <laughs> yeah. I went try to shake his hand. He, like, gave me a little dab. I'm like, oh, he's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think nobody want to play Alabama. I got a lot of respect for Michigan. We're going to see them guys next year, actually. Uh, and down and what this year, we're going to see them guys. But don't nobody want to play uh, Alabama right now. So I think Alabama going to take it. All right. An <laughs> Alabama-Texas uh, championship will be a fun one, a rematch from earlier this season. town Come on home. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. We'll be yeah, there. We'll be there. Right. there Come sure. on home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got orange carpet out there. Treatment, too. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Vince, for joining us. No problem, us. guys. Happy All right, so guys. we were just talking about Alabama. Jalen Milrow went through a lot this season, and there was one thing that we found out this week that we didn't know before. Take a listen. Is there a moment where someone wanted you to play a different position or something, and you kind of said, no, I'm a quarterback? My own offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien, told me I shouldn't play quarterback. Do you remember how you felt when you said that? How would you feel if I told you you suck? Kicked in the turbo, Milrow! Goodbye! Milrow going deep again, man wide open! Got him! Take a bow, Jalen Milrow! He told me a bunch of bits that I could have switched to, but look where I'm at right now, so, you know what I'm saying? So who gets the last laugh? It might be Alabama getting the last laugh after today if they can beat Michigan here at the Rose Bowl and advance to the national championship in Houston. We are just minutes away from kickoff in Pasadena, and look who joins us now. Hi, That's guys. SEC National host <laughs> Laura Rutledge is joining us on the field. Laura, we just heard Jalen Milrow reference what Bill O'Brien suggested yeah. that maybe he do. He improved, and it seemed like Michigan, imp or Alabama improved with him over the course of the season. What was the turning point in your mind for Alabama this year? Yeah, I think if you ask Alabama, they would tell you it was after that USF win that was barely right, a win sure. when Milrow was benched. And even going into the Ole Miss game, which was the following week, you started to see the turning point happen. But really, it was the following week against Mississippi State where they said, all right, now this is an offense that's catered to Milrow's skill set. And Tommy Reese started to open the playbook a little bit more, although he would tell you he's running an offense that he's never run before because yeah. he, you don't you don't just find Jalen Milrow's growing on trees. So yeah. this is a very <laughs> different offense for him. And they started to become what they are now. But they, they still have so much more that they're capable of. In fact, today, I think we'll see a lot more out of this Alabama offense than we've seen prior just because of the time to prepare. So it was really there in that 
kind of earlier part of the season and then it continued to grow with momentum. But as you guys know, it wasn't like Alabama was beating the doors off teams. They were down against Tennessee. They were down mm. against Ole Miss. I mean, there were so many examples of this, a dogfight against A&M where they had to fight. They actually think that helps them today because they've been challenged and had to rise to the occasion. Yeah, and, and I love that you brought up Tommy Reese, him as, having to learn this offense. And I read comments how he said that he felt like some of the turning points was that Texas A&M game where they had to find other ways to win the Ole Miss game where you, you sh have to shut down that offense. And then, of course, LSU, Daniels versus Milrow. Now, you brought up preparation in terms of having a few weeks. We said Michigan changed up the way they prepare for this game because, yeah. you know, it hasn't worked out well for them. <laughs> but has Alabama changed the way they prepare for this game because their secret formula, Lara, has worked? Well, Nick Saban is a creature of habit, as you yeah. guys know. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, if there's one thing you know about Nick Saban, he's going to be consistent and do the same things all the time. So he hasn't changed much. But one of the things that he started doing in recent years is the first few bowl practices, which are right before Christmas time, they don't even focus on the opponent. Right. So they didn't do a lot about Michigan. In fact, it was just good on good, which if you think about a team like Alabama and how they've peaked at this point in the season, Good on good is pretty dang good when you're talking about the ones versus the ones for Bama. So they did that. The players actually felt like it was a really nice reset for them to be challenged against their own teammates. And then they switched to preparing for Michigan, which Saban said this. He said, Michigan does a ton of stuff offensively. And he didn't say stuff. You guys can read between the lines of what he said. <laughs> it's a lot to prepare for. He said that they really had to focus on what they may see. You see those pre-snap shifts and motions, but they're slower than what you see from other teams, right. slow developing to buy the quarterback time. So they really focus in on that. And then Kevin Steele, the defensive coordinator for Alabama, said they had to go all the way back to 2007 to wow. find defenses to run against what this offense will do. So I, I think there's a lot there uh, where this has taken a ton of prep for this Alabama mm. team. Very cool. And it's an old school style of play too. So they got to go back to the drawing right. board, go back to what they used to do. You're absolutely right. Now for Jim Hart, Ball, who really impresses him outside of obviously stopping Jalen Milrow? Who are some of the other game breakers for this Alabama team? Yeah, so Jalen Milrow certainly highlights that list, but he really was impressed by Isaiah Bond and the yeah. way that he's come on in the latter part of the season. He said it really seems like Milrow's gotten a comfortability throwing to Bond, so they're really going to try to look out for him. And, you know, one of the things that Harbaugh and his staff talked about is, is what do you do about Milrow in the offense as a whole? Because you've got to spy him, but then you're losing a defense to spy Milrow. So I right. think they may switch some guys around. He won't have one player spying him. Look for maybe a couple of guys, maybe some linebackers to be on him. That was something that they mentioned too. Another another player that Harbaugh has been really impressed with is Kool-Aid McKinstry. I'd be real yeah. surprised if they intentionally throw to Kool-Aid's side of the field. And Kool-Aid will switch around a little bit and they get creative with that. But yep. they, they said he's really become locked down as a cornerback. There's a couple really good DBs in this game, really good second. Secondaries. Mike Sanders still on the other side, of course, Kool-Aid uh, on this side. Laura, last one for you. We talked about Nick Saban and, and this this whole thing that he's built here at Alabama. I mean, you've been around him for a long time. And like, what, what is the secret? How, how does this keep happening year in and year out? Dude, I think this might be his best coaching year, which is crazy. That's, I mean, if you think yeah. about all of the coaching jobs that he's done, obviously they've had great players. But this was a year where everyone doubted right. him. And everybody said, this team's done after the second week of the season. Us and, included. Yeah, oh my goodness, everybody. <laughs> Everybody was guilty of it, right? And and they know that. Um, I'm sure you guys uh, have seen them wearing the shirts that that say Lang. Lang. Uh, oh, what that mean? What that mean again? It was leave. Wait, what is it? Le let all naysayers know. Let all naysayers know. know. That's let what it is. <laughs> I, th right. I think it means something else for those that know. If you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, Not so, the time. <laughs> so I, I think that what he's done is learn to adjust. And he would say that. It applies to coaching as a whole, but also in game. He said, we don't even put anything that complicated in anymore. We try to stay real simple so we can adjust as things are thrown at us. And that's why he's been able to build a, a master class in coaching that we may never see again. Or Rutledge joining us on the field. About 30 minutes to go before number one Michigan, number four Alabama. It should be a great one. Thanks so much. Thank I can't you, wait. Lance. You guys are awesome. Enjoy the rest of this pregame. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> right, here. We Let's will. Go. We'll see you next week, right? Yes, I, we'll see. I okay. hope. Okay. All right. Good. good deal. Good deal. All right. And let's send you back over to the Sugar Bowl and Harry Douglas. Floor is yours. Now, Christina and Harry, both of you know that my favorite group on this football field mm -hmm. is the wide receiver group. Yeah. So we might as well watch a little film on this wide receiver group that's been dominant all season long. 
We're gonna go with Romo Dunze from Washington. Right now, you're gonna see him one-on-one. -on -one. Watch how he absorbs the contact because of the upper body strength and still has the ability to catch the football for a touchdown. Next, we're gonna look at a stack formation by the Washington Huskies. Now, now that stack formation is gonna force this DB to be in locked coverage. He has this wide receiver, Jalen Pope, man-to-man. -man. Watch Jalen Pope and watch how he gets off the line of scrimmage on a slot fade is what we call it, Dumbo. And then he's gonna catch this, a contested catch, the DB's gonna grab his arm. It's not going to matter because of the upper body strength of him. And last but not least, one of my favorite guys that plays in the slot, Jalen McMillan. You're gonna see him one-on-one -on -one matched up with the safety. A coach told me if a safety guards you son at the wide receiver position, take my uniform off and don't come back. You're gonna see his speed and the angle that he's taking has moved the safety off the hash. Now he has a two-way go. This safety is dead in the water. Big play, explosive play for the Washington Huskies. I think we're gonna see a lot of this today because of the secondary of the Texas Longhorns. All right, HD, you just broke down, obviously, Ojunze and Polk. Uh, where can they find weaknesses in this Texas secondary? Yeah, I'm going to go with freshman corner Malik Muhammad, right? And I was always taught when you have a freshman, whether it's a first-year guy at college or in the National Football League, a rookie corner, you got to attack them any chance that you have that opportunity. I think the veteran leadership in this wide receiver group for the Washington Huskies is one up over the secondary for the Texas Longhorns. Also, at any given time in this ball game. If Michael Penix Jr. sees a safety trying to guard any one of these three wide receivers, you have to baptize them and force them to catch the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's, that's exactly <laughs> how I'm going to put it. You got to force them to do that. And also the contested catches. Michael Penix Jr., just throw the ball up to these guys, let them go up and get it. That's one of the things that they've been proving, not just in 2023, but those guys have proven that in 2022 as well. Contested catches is something they do very, very well. Give them that opportunity and might see some confetti come down for Washington tonight. Okay, uh, let's talk about another um, aspect of their offense and Dylan Johnson, the running back. Yes. Uh, how has he really changed this Washington offense? So he, I don't want to say he was a bandage for this offense, but when Jalen McMillan went down, it changed things, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you go from having three number one wide receivers to two, I mean, it's still pretty dang good, right? But it changed things for them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so he took up a bigger role in this offense. In fact, in the six games since Jalen McMillan got hurt, including the two that he came back for, he accounted for 33% of their scrimmage yards, whereas before the injury, it was just 13%, right? So he had a huge uptick in production. And the fact that we saw that last time we saw this Washington team out and they played Oregon, not only did Dylan Johnson get his with 152 yards, Jalen McMillan also got his as well. And if that is the type of offense that we see today, especially against this Texas defense where the secondary is going to be tested continuously, like you mentioned, HD, mm -hmm. it's going to be a tough day for them. Okay, so another thing that HD talked about when it comes to this Texas defense earlier, and we didn't really get to talk that much about it, is their defensive line. Mm -hmm. How much of a tough task is that going to be for Dylan and this Washington team? Well, it's going to be a tough task because when you look at the two defensive tackles for the Texas Longhorns, Tavondre Sweat and By Byron Murphy the second, those two guys are dominant. And Byron Murphy, he's a guy that's going to get pressure on the quarterback early and often. That's what he's proven all season long. So I think you can't run the football up the middle. You're going to have to try to get on the perimeter a little bit. But I also think tempo. We've seen that from the Oklahoma Sooners. They were able to get tempo and not allow those big guys to get off the football field and uh, made them tired over and over again. And I, I would also say this, the big playability of these wide receivers yeah. I think the, the perimeter for the Washington Huskies can be their biggest ally in rushing the football tonight. But I like Dylan Johnson, man. You, you mentioned that, Harry. He was forgot about early on in the season. Mm. And I think that injury to Jalen McMillan, who only played five games this season, yep. really allowed them to be more balanced offensively. And I think it's going to pay dividends moving forward if they're able to win tonight and then go on to the championship game. Okay, so weird that we've been talking about Washington's offense this much, and we haven't talked about the Heisman runner-up. That is one Michael Penix Jr. Yes. Uh, obviously, all eyes are on him. We mm -hmm. know that the quarterback is a bucket. So how hard is it going to be for him to – what is he going to face tonight when it comes to the pressure of everybody keying in on their quarterback? So the interesting piece, and in HG just mentioned it, is with those defensive tackles, they're going to have to get pressure on him up the middle because this is not something that they do well on the outside, which – honestly kind of plays into what they do. He had 2,000 yards outside the numbers this season, was tops in FBS. It just so happens for this Texas defense, they gave up the third most outside the numbers defensively in FBS. So this is a matchup on paper. Michael Penix, brother, you should absolutely cook tonight. So look, he's got his full arsenal with him. We saw how it looked a month ago against Oregon. That Now that's not to say that Texas can't still make plays, mm -hmm. but 
that's the t dangerous thing about this Washington team, and which is why I feel like they don't even have to have their best defensive game, is because Michael Penix is going to make that defensive secondary make plays. And it comes in waves at times, right? For sure. Like, if, if they get off to a bad start, they get in the second quarter alone, mm -hmm. those, those guys can make big plays, mm -hmm. explosive plays, and score points over and over again. Next thing you know, you're down 14 yep. points at halftime. Yeah. So I think for Texas, you have to contain them and make sure they don't hit you in those waves that we've seen so many times this season. A lot on the line tonight, uh, specifically because this is the last time that the college football playoff is going to look like this college football playoff. Ryan McGee has more. Goodbyes are never easy especially when everyone seems to agree that saying goodbye is the right thing to do. But as we play and watch and consume the final three games of the final edition of the college football playoffs final four team bracket. But the Georgia Bulldogs bludgeon their way to back to back. Let's try to not do what we've done for the last 10 years, looking so far ahead to the idea and now the reality of an expanded playoff that we don't take a moment to appreciate what we've had. Now for only one more go round in the four team CFP bracket. Four teams has been tight. It's been tight. Yes, it's been imperfect. It's been a bit tense, but for so much of the time, it has also been perfectly intense. Looking back, did the four team model ever really get it wrong? Yeah, yeah, we hear y'all in Tallahassee. We also still hear from you Big 12 folks in Fort Worth and Waco, still smarting over your slights a decade ago. Four to four resumes better than ours, you're not finding one. And we will never forget UCF's defiant natty parade in 2017. But that's really it. In 10 years, even the victims of so many blowout semifinal scores or TCU in the title game one year ago. Losing badly on the biggest stage doesn't mean they shouldn't have been there. And are there any national champions since 2014 that we don't think deserve their trophy? The four-team CFP did exactly what it was created to do. It simplified the system. It cleaned up the college football postseason. It gave us some great games. No good. He it. Cinematic moments, and most importantly, undisputed champs. As for inclusion, 15 teams earned invitations, representing six conferences and one independent. See, perfectly imperfect. And it was really, really difficult to earn one of those four invites. That's how a postseason should be, right? So yeah, sometime during this last stand of college football's four horsemen, make sure you pause, reflect, throw up four fingers, Pour one out, or four, for the four-team CFP. The new world will be bigger, and it might be better, but it will most definitely be different. Oh, it is the end of an era. We're very sad to see it go, but it's time now for the at and Countdown to the CFP National Championship. We're gonna look ahead, guys. Obviously, this is the semifinals. Two teams will win today and then they will go to the CFP. But let's do a little prediction. So Alabama-Michigan, that's coming up in a few minutes. Who do you have in that matchup, HD? I'm going Alabama. I think the simple fact when you have a guy like Nick Saban, who is the greatest college coach of all time, you had gave him ample time to prepare for this matchup against the Michigan Wolverines. I think that's going to pay huge dividends for this Alabama football team today. Also, when I look at a quarterback like Jalen Milrow, his big playability, you can have the perfect defense called, but the dynamics of his athleticism allows him to break that perfect defense that you have called and not only hit home runs in the pass game, but be able to do it with his legs as well. Lyles, you got? I'm, I'm going with Alabama as well. Look, I, I think that this matchup is going to be a lot more competitive, and I think this is going to be an incredibly fun game. We're talking about two teams that do not make a lot of mistakes, that are going to you know, really try to grind you out. The one thing about this game you see that sort of stands out to me is I still think that Zach Zinter loss looms large, specifically because of who Alabama's got on that defensive line. Not just because of whether it's Dallas Turner, Chris Braswell, but also because they have just guys on guys on guys. That are, you're going to be able to rotate in there, keep them fresh, and then you don't, we're not even getting to that NFL defensive back here, yep. right? I, I mean, this is an Alabama defense that I think no matter how Jalen Milrow plays, as long as he's just not atrocious, 
I think that Alabama's going to be able to come out on top of this one. Yeah, Alabama has definitely been hitting their stride in the latter half of the season, so it would make sense for everybody to choose Alabama. However, I'm going Michigan because – if you know me, you know I'm not choosing Alabama. Also, <laughs> as I look to the left I and I see our producer out, Cologne I do want to shout out his Cologne yeah. because uh, he <laughs> wants at least one person to choose Michigan out here. I also want to say I feel like it's about time that Michigan wins a bowl game. I mentioned at the beginning of the show that they haven't won a bowl game since 2016. It's been eight years, so I feel like it's about that time. Also, we all know that Michigan feels like they're um, that America. like an injustice America's was done team. to them. They feel like they're America's team. So they have this, like, chip on their shoulder that they put there themselves. So I feel like they're coming out today with a little bit of a different energy. They might not have all the stuff they had at the beginning of the year, but they do have a different energy, I think, going into this matchup. Whatever's so going to work, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Michigan for this one. And, again, I don't choose Alabama. I see a shirt worn by Chris Colon, our producer. It uh -huh. says Michigan versus everybody. Who's everybody? Yeah, that's that's what yeah, I yeah talk know. to yeah, us, yeah. Cologne. Yeah. I wish you could come up here and grab this mic and tell us who the hell is everybody. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to this matchup that we're seeing here, the Sugar Bowl. That's going to be in a few hours. We got Texas taking on Washington. Who do you have in that matchup, Lyles? I got Washington. And, and look, man, it, it's tough picking this game. It really is it because is. especially this game, I could talk myself into either team winning. I just think offensively, Washington is going to be able to do too much for Texas to keep up with the four quarters. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I, I think this will be a fun matchup. I think it's going to be a game going into the second half. How deep it goes in the second half, I'm not certain of that. But I think Michael Penix has his moment this afternoon, this evening, rather. Okay. This is hard for me. This is hard for me, Harry. You know this because Michael Penix is my boy. Right. Boy. You know that's my guy. Mm, sure is. And I love those quarterbacks that can throw it all around the football field, can make every single throw, and all the throws are accurate. But I'm going with the Texas Longhorns in this one. I'm going to go ahead and hook them because I love that defensive line that they have. I love those linebackers that they have. Uh, Anthony Hill Jr., also Jalen Ford. I think he's going to be a guy that plays a pivotal role for the Texas Longhorns defensively. But you look on the offensive side of the ball, I like the wide receiver group and the tight ends for the Texas Longhorns. Mm -hmm. Those guys came up huge in the Alabama win at Brian Denny Stadium. So I think tonight is going to be a matchup that they're going to be able to have a lot of success. We don't talk about that Washington defense so much because they aren't as dominant. Right. right? They have a few guys here and there. They've been able to make plays and key moments to get stops. But when that pressure's on them constantly, I, think, I understand they play Oregon, mm -hmm. but Texas, I think Texas is going to be able to do something tonight. Okay, so I so badly want Washington to win this game. I actually do because I do think they are America's team because they're the one team that nobody hates. I'm going to go with Texas, though, in this one um, just quite simply because I want a Texas-Alabama rematch, Ooh. and I would like Texas to win that one even though I don't think they necessarily <laughs> will. So I'm going Texas, <laughs> hook them uh, for that matchup. Okay, so as I mentioned, Michigan went through a lot this season. We saw it even before the season started that they were dealing with a lot of advers adversity. So, of course, they go into this game with a chip on their shoulder. Take a look at this. What unfinished business represents to me is that all the work that we did in the past few years, we didn't get to where we wanted to go. The last two playoff appearances, just we didn't get it done. We all knew what our goals were, knew what our standard is around here at Michigan. We haven't played our best game of football. We're just trying to play our best best game of football every single time we touch the field, every opportunity we're given. We want more. We don't know what a playoff win feels like, a bowl game win feels like, and we don't know what a national championship looks like. It was never about, you know, winning another Big Ten championship. It was all about winning the national championship. Now, guys, it's hard to believe that the Michigan Wolverines have lost more games in the college football playoff than they have in the last three regular seasons combined. I mean, that is wild. They certainly have unfinished business. Why is he bringing up stats like that, man? <laughs> That's not here, cool. Here is why. We have a game to play before the big game. Okay. And it is called Roses or Thorns, fitting because we are at the Rose Bowl. Absolutely. You can see we worked really hard on the name of the game. <laughs> I like that. But here's how it works. I'm going to give you a couple prop bets, a couple scenarios, and you guys are going to tell me roses if you agree and okay. thorns if you disagree. Roses agree, thorns okay. disagree. Right. And we're going to Start here, Maddie, with you. Yes, sir. Michigan's postseason struggles are a coaching issue. 
roses or thorns to that statement? Roses, man. I mean, in college football and pro football, coaching to me is absolutely everything. The one thing that you notice about the Michigan team, especially in past seasons, is the fact that they play an old school physical brand of football, which really works well in the Big Ten. Yeah. We haven't seen that transition into playoff football. They say this is the team that finally gets them over the hump to do that. We'll see if they try to do exactly what they've been doing all year with that physical nature, winning at the line of scrimmage, or they try to mix it up a little bit here in this one-off game against Alabama. Let me ask, why doesn't it translate? Like, what, 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 what do you think has been missing that it hasn't translated outside of Big Ten play? Well, hey, this is a team that you said earlier on in this in, in this segment, right, that they are a team that's only been down 23 minutes out of this entire season. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're playing from a lead, you're usually pretty comfortable. You usually have the tempo and the pace of the game in your control. An early mistake here against an Alabama team. You put J.J. McCarthy in obvious passing situations early, which right. they're not really built to do consistently. That's where this game could get away from Yeah, them. Michigan down 14-0 against Georgia in that uh, bowl yep. game. They're down 14-0 against TCU. So a fast start is really key here, Matt. So yep. I love the point that you brought up right there. All right, we're coming to you, Scoob, on this one. Roses or thorns to this. Jalen Milrow will have under 200 passing yards and less than two passing touchdowns. Roses or thorns? We're going with thorns for that, fellas. Come on. Now, now ESPN bet has it at about 195.5, yep. so it's really not that much of a difference. They think he'll get close. So for those with investments in this and any type of those interests, I think you go with the over right there. But think about Michigan and the quarterback that they have seen this season. Real quick, yes or no, is this the best quarterback that they're going to see all year? Yes, sir. Captain. Yes, most definitely. And the best quarterback that they've gone against is Tucker Viola from Maryland. Yep. And in hey, that Kyle McCord, Kyle come McCord's on now. Good. And Thank Kyle McCord, let's Let me not do that. Kyle McCord, too. He bowed right. out a little all bit. Right, all right, now but we're both good. those guys had over 220, and I think that Jalen uh, uh, Milrow is going to be able to get there, especially with his big play ability. They just have not seen an offense to this level all season long because we know that it has struggled in the Big Ten. One or two things, if you were talking to Jalen Milrow before this game, what are you telling him? Hey, be calm early on in this football game. Don't let the emotions of everything get in the way right now. Yeah. The biggest thing for both of these quarterbacks is don't lose the game in the first quarter. Emotions are going to be high. It's the first time that you've played in over a month. Just can take what the defense give you. Keep it extremely simple. If it's wide open, take it, but don't force anything unnecessarily early in this game because of how good both of these defenses are. All right, we got a little rushing prop here. Donovan Edwards from Michigan yeah. will have more rushing yards than Jalen Milrow. Roses Ooh. or thorns? Ooh, I'm going to go with thorns and maybe that kind of alludes you to where I'm going with my pick because yeah. I feel like for Alabama to win this game, Jalen Miller has to throw for over 200. He has to rush for probably over 50 to 60 yards to get that W. That's a good too. chunk. That's and a, good a chunk. lot of that is scramble yards, not designed runs. It's him just buying time and space in the passing game. He's an excellent thrower on the run, and his downfield passing, as we've all seen, is really one of the biggest things and the best things that he does. I'll be interested to see if Alabama can get behind Michigan's defensive secondary. All right, Scoob, coming to you on this one. Michigan has kind of been a team that can uh, go slow at times yeah. in the game. Will they need explosive plays to win this game, or can they play the way that they have played in one? Roses, you're absolutely going to need some explosive plays. <laughs> Think back to the Big Ten Championship, y'all. Michigan had two touchdowns. They totaled 11 yards against an Iowa defense, <laughs> quite one frankly. One of the better defenses in the country. Exactly, and I was going to say, I think Alabama is just as good, if not better, than the Iowa defense. So if you're going to struggle against that defense in terms of being able to drive down the field and get points, you're going to need to be able to create it in some type of way. Trick plays, yeah. explosive plays, motion. One thing that Alabama has struggled with is motion-based offenses, and we saw Auburn do that against the Christmas Tide. So I think big plays are definitely going to play a role in here for them to find some type of success. And then when you talk about big plays, big moments in this game, uh, how about the competitive nature of yes. these players coming into it <laughs> in, at media day? Now, I spent some time with the guys and tried to see if they could get the upper hand on each other with some uh, fun little mini activities we had. Check this piece out. The great thing about Media Day is that it gives us access to players on both teams for Alabama and Michigan. And while everyone's asking the same old questions of how are you strategizing for the game? What's your game strategy? Forget about all that. We're going to play some mini games and have these players complete some tasks in a certain amount of time to see who has the competitive edge 
heading into the Rose Bowl. You gotta get that blue cup on the bottom while he's moving one cup at a time. Three, two, one, go. Ah. That's a good start. Oh, I pulled it already. Oh, I pulled it already. <laughs> we got a rhythm going. We got a rhythm going. Ah, dance. <laughs> Three, two, one. Oh, that's a good start. That's a real good, I'm feeling good about this. Yeah. Woo-hoo-hoo. I think we might have one here. I think we might have one here. That was two, that was two cups. Time. Team 64 is the new record. The cookie game. Cookie on forehead, get it to mouth, no hands, you will be timed. Go. <laughs> No hands, no hands. Time, 6.91 seconds. Now that's an interesting technique that you got there, Kendrick. As they say in Mortal Kombat, that was a flawless victory from the Michigan Wolverines. But you know what? That was just a mini game. At the end of the day, we care about this game. And we'll see who comes out on top of that one. All right, let's talk a little bit more about that matchup because it's happening very shortly. Obviously, we have a long time, like a little bit over four hours until we get the Sugar Bowl going. So let's talk about the Rose Bowl. We got Michigan taking on Alabama. And a lot of people like to say that this Michigan offense doesn't have that many explosive plays, but they are really efficient, one of the most efficient um, teams in college football. So, HD, when you approach this as Alabama's defense, how do you handle a team that's not good or elite at everything, but is good at everything? Number one, you can't make mistakes if you're Alabama, right? Over the past few years, we've seen Alabama not be the most disciplined team. They have penalties and help out their opponents. Number two, I will go with this, force them to be one-dimensional. So if you're stopping the run and you're forcing A.J. McCarthy to be a passer, and the reason why I say that is because I believe more in Alabama secondary. When you look at Caleb Downs, who was a freshman but playing at a high level, you look at Kool-Aid McKinstry, you look at Arnold, you also look at Malachi Moore in the slot. Those guys, I believe in more so than the skill position players for Michigan. And then thirdly, you're Alabama. You recruit five and four-star guys at a rapid pace, right? There's a reason why Nick Saban is the greatest coach of all time. So you believe in those type of things right there, and I think you'll have a, a solid day. All right, let's talk about Jalen Milrow because that's been the conversation all season for this Alabama team. He was the reason that they lost to Texas, and he is the reason that they're doing what they are, one of the reasons that they're doing what they are now. So there's good Jalen and there's bad Jalen. Yes. What do they need to do, Lyles, in order to make it a good Jalen day? Is it, am I making this too plain? I, I feel like they just need to stay engaged. Stay engaged and don't fall behind. And when I say stay engaged, you need Isaiah Bond, right? You need Jace McClellan. You need his guys to be active, you can't really have any dormant performers today. And I think as long as you have that, I think, I truly believe Jalen Miller is going to be fine because he's not turning the football over the way that he was. A lot of the plays that he was making earlier in the season and the reason he got benched was because it was like, dude, like what, what are you doing? And, and we really haven't seen that out of him. He hasn't yeah. been turning the football over. So I think, and we talked about this earlier before we got here to the stadium, if you're able to not fall behind by more than two scores, I think that you're going to be okay. And so as long as they do that, I think that they're going to be in good shape and you're going to see good Jalen. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's talk about this Michigan offense. They struggled but won against four top 20 defenses in their final four games. How do you attack an Alabama team that is also in the top 10 in defense? I think something Michigan does well, shifts and motions before the ball's even snapped. Shift and then motion guys to force Alabama defense as a unit to communicate and be on the same page. That has given Alabama problems the last few years as well. Uh, number two, I'm going to go with the run game, and that's including J.J. McCarthy. The type of quarterbacks that have given Alabama problems over the last few years as well has been dual-threat guys. So J.J. Yeah. McCarthy is going to have to be a part of the run game at a rapid pace, in my opinion, today to be able to win this ball game. And last but not least, when you have shots, you have to hit them, you have to make them. Remember last year in the semifinals game versus TCU? They had a couple plays early in that game. It didn't go their way. It uh, came back to bite them in the end, and they didn't get a chance to win it. So mm -hmm. when you have the shot plays and the opportunity to have explosive plays, you got to hit them, and you can't, you can't uh, let those things fall by the wayside. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about Jalen Milrow because uh, the focus has been stopping him. Obviously, he's a dual-threat quarterback. He's really good, but he also throws a really good deep ball, yep. right? We know that Michigan, we saw how they did against Ohio State with the deep ball. What can they learn from that game and apply it to this Alabama team? If I'm Michigan's defense 
and I'm going I'm to oversimplify this again, but I, I think if this should give you confidence, if you're Michigan, you went up and played against the number two overall pick in the NFL draft coming up in Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Yeah. The rest of the wide receivers in that room are also going to be NFL players. Some might even be day one picks as well. I think Will Johnson is going to show a lot of people that he is a very good – one of the best in all of FBS. And so if, if you're this Michigan defense and you're going up against Isaiah Bond and, Jer and Jermaine Burton, that's not to say that you can't take them seriously – but you escaped Ohio State. You saw the toughest wide receiver room you're probably going to see outside of Washington. Outside of Washington. Just want to make that clear. But that should give you confidence going into this one, knowing that you're well-equipped to handle what you're going to see in front of you today. And so if you're Michigan, I, I think you got to go in here and, and stick your chest out a little bit. It's going to be a really good one. We're very excited about it. We have a few hours before we actually get to see live football, so we're very excited about that. Happy New Year. We didn't say that either. Um, any final thoughts that you guys want to say before we toss it to our guys over no, there? No, I would go with uh, Michigan when Jalen Milrow was uh, scrambling around, right? Be alert for the big play, like the secondary, because that's one of the things that they love to do. Jermaine Burton has been a big play guy. He's averaging over 20 yards per catch, and being able to be dynamic for him and being that speed guy, make sure you're defending the back end at all times. Mm -hmm. You can never take a playoff because Jalen Miro is so good and dynamic in doing so. That turnovers kind of turnover is going to be the big one in this game. Michigan eighth and FBS and takeaways. Whatever team wins that battle, I think probably ends up winning this game. I'm trying to see Michigan crying at the end. Blake Quorum with his face all bloody. <laughs> Michigan, hey. get a dub. <laughs> Anyways, that's all we got here from New Orleans. We'll see you guys later. Back to you out there in Pasadena. Thank you so much, Christine. I got to be honest, I couldn't hear a word you just said <laughs> because it is loud here in the Rose Bowl. We're at the real party right now. Uh, 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 there is a lot of blue and maize in the stadium here, and you can see the marching band marching right towards us at the end zone. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. How great is this? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Hit it, girl. And by the way, we do have Marty McGee. Marty not joining us. McGee I'm is sorry. joining Everybody us. Everybody thinks my first name is Marty. Yeah. That's all. Right. That's all right. uh, and you just came from the Rose Bowl Parade. I did. Yeah. How I was, was that? Rose Bowl. It was amazing. I, I literally, my elbow hurt so bad, right? <laughs> but, you know, what I learned is, is that you know, the parade started in 1890. This game started in, like, 1902, and then a little bit later they started again. Those people at the Tournament of Roses, they don't even know this game is going on. Like, that, 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 <laughs> that parade is why they're here. So, yeah, three and a half hours of this. And uh, it was awesome. I mean, it, it, it's hard to believe as a kid you grew up watching the parade, and now you're in it for three and a half hours, and then you come over, like, to the Rose Bowl. You know, I'm a North Carolina kid. You don't right. think you're ever going to be here. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's a fantastic. But you get a game like this, too, with yeah. Michigan and Alabama. I mean, this completes the whole thing. This is awesome. Well, and you talk about 1902 was the first Rose Bowl. Michigan played in that game. 1926, the first time a Southern team was invited to the Rose Bowl was Alabama. Yeah. I mean, Bear Bryant was here, right? right. I mean, the, the hit, you walk around and the history is ridiculous. And these two teams, as you guys know, have only played like five times. So to have them in this game, they've never played with this type of stakes. And to have them in what I feel like might be the last kind of old school Rose Bowl. Yeah. Right? And know whatever this, the span of playoffs is going to be. So it just is fitting to me that it's, it's, to me, it's the winningest team in the history of football, right. Michigan, and the second winningest team in Alabama. And they're in the game, and I think it's great. Yeah, and I think that's why this game is so special. And this atmosphere has been absolutely electric. You were just talking about it's definitely at least 70 30 for Michigan at yeah. this point. Yeah. And the, the way that these Michigan fans are cheering on the team is something that we expected, right? And uh, Molly told, Holly told us that she thinks Nick Saban has more pressure in this game. Who do you think has more pressure? I don't know that Nick Saban feels a lot of pressure. You know, I, mean? I, I was <laughs> yeah. down there two weeks ago and I talked to Coach and I talked to Jalen Milrow and. and they're very confident, right? right? You know, they've been there, done that, which I think is so important, and why I think Michigan has a better chance now because they've been in the playoff the last couple of years. The been there, done that factor is is invaluable, and yeah. Alabama has that. I mean, every kid on the team has already played in the national championship game, so so <laughs> it, it, you know, so, so it, it will be interesting going forward. But yeah, I think there's pressure, especially if he retires next week, right? So you want to you want to win. Right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just saying, Twitter said, right? So yeah. true. You're right. No, no doubt about it. We got about a minute left. Let's make some quick picks, McGee. I'm not going to have you pick, but you guys give me a quick pick for this game. Man, the crowd makes me think otherwise, but I'm still going to go with what I thought originally. I'm taking Alabama 31, Michigan 17. Alabama pulls away in this game late.
We're going with Alabama 27-24. Roll Tide in this game. I just think their offense has more firepower than Michigan to get this game. I'll save the graphic. I'll take Michigan. Boring wins sometimes, guys. Boring can win. Yeah. And I think that boring might win uh, here tonight. But any final thoughts for you, Mr. Yeah, McGee? Yeah, well, you talk about boring. It, the, the one person that Saban kept talking about was Blake Corum. Right. And the one person that Kool-Aid kept talking about was Blake Corum. And right. so if there's one, someone who's literally going to tilt the field in this game, it's the most boring position on the field, right? It's just running it downfield. Yeah. That's what Blake does, and that he's the one they're nervous about. And you've heard Paul earlier in the week, Paul Feinbaum, yeah. say Alabama, speed, Michigan, big and strong. Which one wins as far as that battle? Is it the speed or is it the heavyweight aspect of Michigan in this Yeah, I flew one? out here with Paul on Friday, and I can tell you the Michigan fans, are, they're, they're big Paul Feinbaum. Yeah, I bet yeah. they are. <laughs> LAX was just boo. Uh, I, <laughs> all the way to the taxi. I, I heard there was a smattering of boos at the parade today, too. Yeah, it was like, yeah. No, no, there were so many – Michigan, I, I, all I know about the parade route is the Michigan fans, it was 9-1. to one. Right. And so, But they know how to be here. Right. Yeah. They've been in this game more than any other program. They know how to be here. They know where to stay. Right. Yeah. You know, they they kind of have it down. And this is, and I think they feel, too, this is kind of the last old-school Rose Bowl. Right. Right. They want right. to make sure they were here. But, yeah, a lot Definitely. of amazing blue in here today, boys. Yes, sir. It certainly is amazing. This is going to be a terrific Beautiful. atmosphere, a great game. <laughs> Uh, kicking off in a matter of moments, by the way, Michigan and Alabama and then the Sugar Bowl later on yeah. this evening And to as everyone well. watching, we will have a little bit of the game on this stream after we're done. Yes, we will. We certainly will. For Matt Sims, Scooby McGezza, Ryan McGee joining us late as well. I'm Sam Ravage. Thanks so much for watching Countdown to the College Football Playoff Semifinal presented by AT&T. The semifinal at the Rose Bowl game presented by Prudential is next. Number one, Michigan. Number four, Alabama. Coming Woo! up on ESPN.